Everybody, how's it hanging? How's it happening? You guys know this is Kevin from the Chord Progression Podcast, but the city rocks or rock and roll thrive. Wish you guys a happy Thursday. It is March 11th here in the year of our Lord 2021. And well, we're going to start out with this. We're just going to tell you about this band because you guys know me. I love me my punk rock, hard rock, and metalcore, but you guys know I like to venture into some other different things as well. And I'm venturing into death metal today with the band Sanguasugabog. Yes. Sanguasugabog. And if you guys need to know how to say that again, it is Sanguasugabog. Got to talk with their lead singer, Devin. We got to talk about a little bit about their new album, their debut album, Tortured Hole, which comes out on March 26th. We talk about their video for Menstrual Envy. And then we just get into some other great stuff as well about music live shows. And I mean, I'll put it this way. After you're done listening to this podcast, you're going to just want live shows to return even more so that you can go and see Sanguasugabog live because you want to know who also wants to see sanguasugabog live me so enough with the theatrics are you guys ready let's go yeah well 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 ladies and gentlemen boys and girls listeners of the core progression podcast you know we usually go with like hard rock metal metal core some punk rock kind of stuff and when it comes to more that death metal death core stuff kind of starting to dive a little bit more into it and this one is no exception. We're definitely diving into more of the death metal style. So please welcome Devin from the band. I got to make sure to pronounce the name right. Sanguasugabog. Yes. I did. Right. Woo. So welcome to the Core Progression Podcast, Devin. Oh yeah, Kevin. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for Glad being be here. Thanks for being on as well. Excited to have you on as well. Excited that I got to, I'm going to interview someone else in the more, well, I'll say death scene, death, death metal, death core, whatever it might be, because slowly starting to try and get into some of that music as well, more so. So We'll see how it goes going on. So, Devin, I always like to start out with this to really get people to know you where I always ask you three questions. First two are easy. Last one, a little bit tougher. First, I want to know what your name is. And I lost your video. There we go. There it is. So first is, I want to know what your name is. Second is, I want to know what you do in the band Sanguasugabog. There we go. And the third thing is always my favorite. I want to know a little fun fact about yourself or a little fun story about yourself, but I always want to hear the wackiest thing you could possibly think of. I've heard a lot of different stories. I've heard bands of chloroforming other members of the bands, taking them to the beach and like burying them halfway in the sand, making it look like their legs got cut off just, you know, for fun. So if you can top something like that, I'm ready. All right, cool. So uh, my name is Devin Swank. Uh, I sing and sing with Sugabog, or you could call it that. And um, a weird thing about me is kind of wanted to start a rumor that, um, you know, with our first advancement from the label that our guitarist Cameron is going to get a vagina and replace with his penis. And then for the second advancement for LP2, he's going to get his dick back, but bigger. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm very curious to hear how that would work out with the whole entire, like, start the rumor and just see how that would progress, especially just seeing how the kind of press that you guys would get off of something like that. Yeah, I think maybe if we amputate uh, his left leg, because he'll need his arms to play. But uh, if we amputate one of his legs and just put like a something in there uh, <laughs> to make it look like he has a big dick, then uh, we could have everybody go along with it. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, if if you were able to pull something off like that, especially when live shows go and you just see him out on stage, like kind of stand like. Oh, I'd say standing there, kind of like standing up a little bit, but also like sitting on something yeah. because, you know, he's going to be without a whole leg. People are going to be looking like, oh, my God, look at that guy. Right. He's, Just do it he... leaning over his half stack. Like, yeah. Oh. But, be uh... like, I would say it'd be like the South Park episode where the Randy Marsh gets uh, testicular cancer by putting his balls in the microwave and they're yeah, bouncing around. Bouncing outside. Him. Everyone, yeah. gonna, everyone's going to look and be like, wow, that guy's got nice balls. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I'll say that would definitely be something to see. And if if for some reason something like that happens when live shows return, please, 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 for the love of God, let me know because I definitely want to see this in person. You'll be the first one I tell, I promise you. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Woo! 
Alrighty, so really diving deep into it because uh, you guys have a your debut album called Tortured Hole coming out on March 26. Want to get that out there early so everyone that's listening to the podcast, you know, you get a little bit of that early right away so that you you know can go to Spotify and go to iTunes and go or, or Apple Music go wherever it is. Pre save that right now just so that you know we'll get that out of the way right away. Just so that if you decide to you know just tail off at the end of the podcast, then you don't forget. So go do that right now. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it'll be out in about a month. So, uh, you know, we got a couple of singles and stuff that we're dropping along the way. Um, actually got one uh, coming out really soon. So to give everyone a little taste of what we got cooking up for them. And I mean, and you've already dropped one with Menstrual Envy off of the uh, off the album. Is that correct? Yeah, we've dropped uh, two uh, so far. Um like there was a live action music video, Minstrel NV, and then we did an animated video called Dead as Shit. Um, but yeah, we have a another single, another music video, and then we're actually um going back uh to Troma to film something else that's off the album um and release that after its release. Interesting. I gotta ask about the video for Menstrual Envy though, mostly because I still remember the uh, little press release I got from Adam Splitter. It's like, okay, you gotta watch this video. Like, it's make sure you're watching it because it's not safe for work. So watch it on your own time. Like, okay, well, you know, we're in a pandemic. I'm working from home, so I don't yeah. think you gotta worry about anybody watching me watch this. And all of a sudden, I started watching. I'm just sitting here thinking, what in the absolute hell were you guys thinking when you made this thing? Because I have no idea what you guys were thinking of based on all of a sudden I'm seeing like these gigantic dicks come out all of a sudden they're kind of coming out like the alien like that little scene from alien where the alien just the busts out the guy's chest. Yeah, yeah that's pretty much what I thought of like and then all of a sudden there's these women that come in they like spray one of the dicks and the thing just like falls off completely I'm just thinking what in the hell were you guys thinking when you made this because I just couldn't get I, I was trying to wrap my head around the whole entire video but I couldn't get around the fact that you know all of a sudden, I'm literally seeing these alien dicks, and then all of a sudden, get them like sprayed with a Windex bottle, and they just completely fall off and wither away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard to uh, come at it with uh, a bunch of logic because we're all dumb in this band. But um, the idea kind of spawned off when um, we were driving back from practice, and we were discussing uh, Century Media giving us a music video budget, and uh, I was just like. I was, lo- I was looking over to Cameron and we were driving back from rehearsal and I was just like, man, you know, maybe we can also work out a budget where, where, uh, Century Media gives us surgery to have bigger dicks, you know, and that way, uh, <laughs> cause we can't come out there playing little dick death metal. We got to come out there with these big death metal dicks swinging. <laughs> and I was like, man, what if that surgery goes wrong and a bunch of weird shit happens. And Cameron was like, dude, that would be a perfect music video idea. And we approached, uh, you know, Troma Entertainment, the guys that did uh, Toxic Avenger, uh, Class of Newcomb High, Tromeo and Juliet, like all those uh, movies. And um, they came back with a, a script like right away. They were like, dude, that's perfect. Let's get to work on it. And um, when they gave us the first rendition of the script, everything that's included in the music video was mentioned on there. And I was like, that works. You know, I think uh, half of the band didn't even read all of it. We were just like, fuck it, let's do it. So, uh, yeah, it definitely doesn't make sense because it's like the chicks that do the surgery, they had the uh, spritzer to get rid of our dicks on stat. So it's like they knew that that was going to happen or something. I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, definitely hard to wrap your head around it when you uh, look at it with a clear mind. I think you have to be uh, a little inebriated or something watching it to understand it. Definitely should have been. Oh. If I would have known that, I'd definitely have taken like five or six shots of tequila, waited about 15 minutes, and then watch it. And just probably would have laughed my ass off the whole entire time watching it. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me wrong. I yeah. did laugh while watching it. But if I would have been also drunk at tequila, I probably would have fallen out of my chair, maybe bashed my head on the table, possibly got a concussion, but was would have been laughing the whole entire time. Would have been worth it. Totally worth it. But not only that, but like just the style that you guys went with off of that music video too, it, where it kind of had some of those, I don't know exactly the best way to put it, but it was like this, the way the effects were done, it was like well, all practical, but also kind of look ca- like that campy style in a way at the same time. It's spe- just also just try use it to kind of take more of this like lighthearted feel to the video at the same time, lighthearted horror feel. Also with this heavy death metal track over at the same time as well. There's just so much going on where it's, 
when I was listening to the music, I, I don't think I listen to the music without watching the video. Cause I'm like, I just want to, every time I listen to the song, I just want to watch this video as it goes through. Cause it was just so much fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's the thing too, is like, um, you know, trauma being in the, the motion picture business since the seventies, uh, they're known for doing like those low budget campy horror films and, uh, trying to make money out of them. Uh, there's been bands in the past that have done uh, music videos with them before, like uh, Newfound Glory. I think the Plasmatics did a video with them too. And those videos are kind of, um, I would say like soft or cute in a way. And we're just like, man, if we're working with Troma, we just need to go, you know, balls to the wall. It's gotta be gory. It's gotta be really weird. So uh, they definitely went all out and, um, uh, went above and beyond our expectations doing them. And there's a, there's a part two of that video too. That'll be coming out soon. There's a part two to this video. My God, mm -hmm. you're making me just like super excited for this shit, man. <laughs> yeah. When the, uh, when the dick jumps into, jumps out of the window and goes into that bad of toxic waste, he turns into like a giant, um, dick monster, kind of like Geigen. And uh, just tries to wreak havoc at the city, and it's it's up to us to, to save the world. So that's what part two is all about. Uh, uh, dare I ask how you guys are going to save the world, or are you just going to tell me? Well, you got to wait till it comes out to see, man. Got to wait till it comes out. That's but, what I uh, thought you were going to say. It's, it's definitely awesome. Um, I would say this. I mean, there is like a uh, there is like a mecha, like maga, like fight and stuff that happens. So. Imagine a big dick monster and another monster just going at it in the city. You're pretty much like at this point doing like Godzilla versus Kong, but big giant dick versus monster to be named later. That's right. Team, uh, team Godzilla. So yeah, that's for a, sure. I say good yeah, call that's... because Godzilla's the way to go, man. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But when it really came down to, of course, like, because of when it comes to listening or watching the music video, of course, the biggest thing around that not only is going to be the uh, visuals, but also the music around it as well. And when it comes to, I'm just going to be completely honest, when it comes to death metal and when it comes to like something else like deathcore as well, just kind of using those uh, as an example. For myself personally, when it comes to the vocals, was just how deep and raw and unclean and visceral they are. Mm -hmm. At times for me, it's it, like, just, I'm just going to be completely honest. At times for me, it's kind of harder to follow along with that just because I just, can't necessarily get into that as much personally however i'm starting to try and get a little bit more into that as well because i got all of a sudden it was like go from hard rock i'll sing get a little more head metal get some metal core getting more used to those unclean vocals and all of a sudden okay i'm trying to start listening to some more deathcore stuff some more death metal stuff so i'm starting to try and work my way into it very slowly but also very assuredly as well however especially on something like menstrual envy it was the instrumentals even though they were heavy there was one little thing with the guitar especially like in the intro and more in the verse as well had like this higher distortion to it just a little bit that kind of for someone like myself honestly made it a rather nice to follow at the same time it looks like i kind of feel the song go along just by using that as my guide yeah yeah i mean uh that's uh kind of our whole idea behind the band is to keep a, a steady groove and everything going and then uh when everything gets a little methodical and uh crazy um you know, we still try to keep somewhat of like a like a two step or uh, or a D beat going on drums just to still keep people's attention on it. Uh, but yeah, the definitely we use a lot of heavy distortion. Um, you know, Cameron plays out of our guitarist. He plays out of two different cabs, two heads. He's in a drop tuning. He's got pedals. So it's uh, it's seriously like a buzzsaw, you know, on <laughs> guitars. And then um but yeah, man, uh, I know, I know you didn't really ask, but if there are, uh, if you're, if hardcore is like more your thing, then there's definitely a lot of bands out there that kind of like transition uh, pretty well, even with uh, those kind of vocals like Irate from New York or Internal Bleeding. Um, those were like one of the first bands in the genre that I kind of like latched onto that helped me like get a little bit further into it. I, and honestly, I'm, I'm glad that you said that as well, just because I've talked with a couple, like the other one of the other bands that I talked to is a smaller deathcore band called Kill the Imposter, and they kind of said the same thing, where it's just slowly trying to get into it, because if you jump like headfirst into it and you're not super into it right away, 
Mm -hmm. you're probably going to end up being like, whoa, this ain't for me. But I'm like, well, I kind of want to listen to more music. I want to know more about what's out there. I really want to understand it, especially more of that, whoever it is, rock or metal in any genre that or subgenre that gets based off of it. So when it comes to that, it's like if it's going to be something a little more transient between like death metal, deathcore, and then go more hardcore at the same time as well, just to kind of slowly ease into it, kind of how I slowly <laughs> ease into metalcore by listening to Motionless and White's uh, Graveyard Shift album, and then started getting in a lot more of it. It's like, okay, that's definitely something that I can start on. So thank you for the suggestion, actually. For sure, man. That's what I'm here for. I'm like a, an encyclopedia of useless metal knowledge. So. <laughs> Don't worry, I become an encyclopedia of useless knowledge when it comes to just you know, trying to look deep into music and trying to figure out certain things about it. Cause it's like, there's times like I'll go through songs. I'll go through as best I can. It's like, okay, how many pages do you have analyzing the song? Yeah. About four or five, just like in depth. (laughs) I'm like, Oh dear God, how the hell am I doing this? Right. Yeah, definitely. But when it comes to just like, cause listening to the vocals that you use, especially on something like this as well, they're super deep and unclean, especially like I, I saw two different types of patterns on there. And what I, like, especially like more like the verses, the vocals used super deep, super unclean. However, what I liked about them was they were really consistent with the pace that the backing instrumentals were going with because you kept up the energy, you kept up the drive of the song overall that the instrumentals were really playing off of. Plus, mixing them in with that like higher distortion guitar here was a much better move to in order to maximize both the vocals and then also use those instrumentals to your advantage as well to kind of have that like contrast thing going on with. The guitars in your vocals, but then also having the comparison thing going with your vocals and then the heavy drumming that was accompanying it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I wanted it to follow everything just so it doesn't um the vocal patterns and stuff don't get lost. So like I something I like to do is uh either match the guitars or match the snare counts. And um that way it it keeps like a flow, like a steady a steady rhythm. And um I get that from just like a lot of the bands that I listen to that were also influenced by like, uh, you know, groovy, like punk and hardcore. Um, Weirdly enough, I also uh, get a lot of influence from that kind of technique from um, a lot of uh, New York and Memphis uh, hip hop as well. So trying to keep like a flow and stuff going the entire song. And that's something that's really interesting to bring up with as well, just because you're using different influences from other genres as well, whether it's a more hardcore, more punk, even more hip hop as well, but also using what works with those different genres and understanding how different things work and how different things are pulled out of those to maximize what you're trying to say in that song, where you're trying to produce in that same song as well. Understand that just, I mean, that'll work out to your advantage on something like this to where as with those deep, unclean vocals they really feel like they're a part of the song and they really feel like they're really taking the full force of the instrumentals and really making sure that the song sounds whole by just understanding the pacing and making sure that, okay, I want to follow along with this. I want to follow along with the singer. I want to also contrast against that higher distortion guitar at this point as well. And by doing that, especially in the verses, it really did work out well. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes uh, you can get lost in uh, the whole sauce, but uh that's the that's the weird thing about a lot of our songs too is like um it's a band that i would kind of compare us to as far as like structure rise um i don't even ever heard of uh animosity at all but i've heard uh, the name i just haven't heard anything from them i I know the name though yeah something that um they were really keen on uh you know a lot of those members were, were great musicians some of them went on to be in like despised icons some of them went on to be in uh animals as leaders and a lot of other successful bands, but something that they were really keen on is they would just keep a steady pace like riff. And then when you think that they would start to slow everything down, then they have another riff with that same intensity, but it's a totally different groove. And um, I think we kind of bit off that a little bit just because of the kind of atmosphere that we have when we play live, Uh, people are um, mosh pitting like crazy We've had people stage dive, crowd surf. There's walls of death at our shows and stuff like that, too. So we just want to play like, you know, the most intense music possible uh, so people can knock each other down to and pick each other back up for it. Well, then now I'm super glad I wore this shirt on doing this podcast eh, because we're talking about mosh pits, walls of death and, you know, people just bodies flying everywhere. That's pretty much when I go to shows, that's what I do because it just, I absolutely love it every step of the way. And the times I get the, the mo- like the most injured at shows, like I look at like different, like black eyes, different cuts on my face, just bleeding all over the place. 
I'm always wearing this shirt. So when live shows return and you know, it, if I get, when I get a chance to see you guys, I'll probably pull out this shirt as well. Cause I'm like, you know what? I'm probably gonna be in the front of a wall of death. I'm probably gonna end up getting hurt at some point. I'm gonna love every minute of it. So definitely gotta make that happen. There you go, man. Old faithful. Gotta have a, a trusty, uh, uh, show gear. So, uh, something that you're not scared to get a little blood on. I think that, that I think the first, the, yeah, the, literally the first day I had this shirt when I bought it at, at, uh, it was a, at a Pennywise anti-flag show. I'm pretty sure I got blood on it like that, like within about maybe 15 minutes of buying it. So I'm like, and then I wore it to the next like couple of shows I went to, went, wore it to a Rise Against show and nice. in Chicago. And then I wore it to an After the Burial Emotionless and White show. And that's the one where I basically had this giant cut above my eye, was bleeding all over the place. I mean, there's probably still blood stains on this thing. I have no idea. <laughs> I've, I've yeah. washed them out. I mean, it's been over a, almost a year since concerts had happened. So, yeah. Probably oh, yeah, dude. They probably washed Don't, away. For sure. Don't get rid of it. And if uh, you get too big for it, that's when you just cut the sleeves. <laughs> oh, oh, when I bought this thing, you're like, yeah, the only size that we have is a large. And it's just, I can fit into a large, but I like a medium a little bit more. So, I'm like, okay, so it's a little bit big for me. Perfect. Oh, yeah. But yeah, when live shows change, because I'm because actually like just listening to music as well, I could easily tell right from there. I'm like, okay, when live shows come back, when these guys are back up on stage, what this is, what are these live shows going to be like? I'm like, I'm expecting to be heavy, bro. I'm expecting these insane mobs. I'm expecting walls of death at the same time as well. And you confirming that right there, I'm like, okay, now I definitely have to see you guys play live because I want to experience something like this. Plus, with how crazy that music video is, I'm very curious also to see what you guys would potentially be doing on stage, and if you guys would be bringing out these alien like dicks at some time, kind of like, kind of like in that same style that like uh, like Guar would do with all the crazy <laughs> shit that they bring out. Yeah, we um, we've been contacted by uh, a lot of um, special effects directors and and uh, people in the business um ab about using stage props and uh, things like that. I won't give too much out because uh hopefully some of that stuff will be done before you know we return back on stage but uh we definitely have uh something planned that does incorporate that video and other videos as well that we're going to be doing to bring on stage so yeah i mean you can expect us to get a, a little bit theatrical uh to a, a sense but uh nothing uh too over the top just because uh you know, people like to stage dive and stuff. So we don't want anybody to be tripping over anything. We don't want to hold venues reliable of people getting hurt or things getting broken and things like that. But yeah, we definitely, uh, definitely plan on incorporating some kind of theatrical aspect, especially with that song when we play it live. And I, I gotta, I gotta think that's a good idea as well. And the way that you have the idea around it, because you're going to bring a little bit more to your show at the same time as well. It's just people that aren't going to be going crazy, doing the stage. I've stuff, going mosh pit wall of death, that kind of stuff. They're going to be able to watch that. And just all of a sudden they're going to be able to get into the show a little bit more so than they might have beforehand, just because they've watched a the music video and others seen it. Or if they may have not watched music video, maybe they got uh, forced to or like dragged there by a friend or something. All of a sudden they're seeing, they're like, okay, what the hell is this? Now, this is something I really want to watch. And all of a sudden, they're just going to have their looks like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I have a feeling, um, you know, last year before COVID and everything first came about, um, you know, we played two headline, two headline tours, so people expected, you know, what they were going to get from us. Um, you know, I, I've... I have a feeling that after everything's back to normal and what we originally had planned last year was we were going to do a lot of support tours and um, so play to a whole new crowd, like all together. We were also going to do a uh, harm's way and a uh, Acacia strain tour that got canceled. And that would have been a whole new crowd for us like every night. So we definitely want to bring something a little bit different to the table that uh, live that a lot of bands like kind of sleep on. Yeah, because even like me thinking about it as well, it's do not get me wrong. There are times when bands, it's just they don't really go with all the theatrical stuff. It's just you're going to go out there, you're going to play, you're going to try and drive energy, you're going to create that energy as well. And don't get me wrong, I love when bands do it because like a lot of times they'll use punk rock bands. Whenever I see a punk rock band, I mean, I absolutely love it every step of the way. So I totally mm -hmm. understand that. But then there's also different things where you bring in certain theatrics, certain themes around there that you can keep that music and that drive just as heavy and that those theatrics just add to it. And they don't destroy, like they don't take away from the overall like energy of the performance. It's not like a full transitional piece. 
like I'm trying to think of a good example, like a like a band like Ice Nine Kills, like they bring in all the horror stuff, but yeah. and they do use some of it as a theatrical thing, but it's not like necessarily the main part of it. Whereas a band like I would say in this moment, because I've seen them alive a couple of times, like the theatrics are a main thing. So you're really not going crazy during their shows. You're watching the performance because of all the theatrics that are going on. What it sounds like what you guys are trying to go for is add that little bit of theatrics in there just so that people that don't necessarily want to go absolutely crazy in the mosh pit go super crazy in the wall of death or stage dive. Like when they're watching the show, they have something else they can latch on to. However, yeah. it's not going to be anything that's going to distract, like take away from the heaviness and the energy of your performance or really force any kind of weird changes to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, it, if it's anything that we incorporate, it's for uh, maybe like one or two songs or we have uh, two or three things that, uh, we set up on stage um something that we use a lot live versus the recordings is we use a lot of samples um a lot of synth like interludes and stuff between songs uh we're really heavy on uh fog machines we love them you know so uh we like to to get a whole venue like smoky uh there's been a couple times where we've set off smoke detectors and stuff too and <laughs> the fire departments had to come in and check everything out, scope it all out, make sure everybody's okay. So uh, we're just probably just going to put a little bit more, uh, put a little bit of sprinkles on that cake, you know, that we already have. And I like that as idea as well, because there are times where, especially with the heavy kind of music that you guys play as well. And if you guys are going to be keep like running through songs back to back to back and you get those, all of those crazy guys in the mosh pit or in the wall of death or people stage diving as well. We're going to be going crazy, you know, maybe like if you guys just play straight, you know, for an hour straight, there's times where all of a sudden those venues, it doesn't matter what time of the year it is. If it's summer and there's no AC or even if it's winter and it's negative 20 outside, it's going to get freaking hot in those days. It's going to be hot and humid. We're going to, it's like, you know, there's going to be a point in time where you got to get a little bit of a break, honestly. So doing a couple of those interludes as well really does help out. I'm not going to lie because I've been there before. Where I'm just like, we can use an interlude right now. Helps them get oh, a yeah. one minute interlude. Thank you. Yeah, usually need to take a second, shoot shoot the shit with my drummer, and uh, take a swig of my beer before we get back into business. So it's good to have a a little bit of a breather, you know, because we're all we're all burning. I always sweat my ass off on stage. I sweat profusely, like you could. I wear it all the time. So uh, yeah, definitely definitely feels good when you're playing uh, a bunch of chaotic fast songs to take a little bit of breather in between here and there. Oh, oh, absolutely. And not only that, but it's just there's that's also a time too where all the fans are going crazy as well. Well, you're able to kind of just take a little bit of a breather. We're able to take a little bit of a breather at the same time. And it's just it, it ends up fitting with the overall theme of the show, too, just because when you guys are up on stage and you're providing this insane heavy energy and the fans are feeling that and the fans are going to deliver it right back to you by going absolutely crazy, jumping off the stage, smashing into each other, people fall on the ground, picking each other back up. What's going to happen is even when you get to that point where, you know, you need a little bit of a break to do like a one minute interlude kind of thing, we're going to do the same thing as well. And that energy is not going to leave. Like we're going to still kind of keep that energy. It's like, okay, we're going to keep it simmering until you guys start playing again. All of a sudden it's just going to explode like a powder keg. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, uh, you know, there's sound and stuff that's going to be playing the whole time. Uh, occasionally you'll just hear me like crack a joke or I'll shout everybody out. I'll see people out in the crowd that I know. and say what's up to them and then uh it's like all right let's get back down to business um you know it was weird our first tour we only had uh, 11 minutes of music out at the time so we would play that and then we would play like two or three songs and that weren't included on the ep and um so it added up to maybe about a 20 minute live set which was funny because like our first like two shows that we'd play I'd say some stuff here and there, but it really, I just wanted to get back into people just going nuts on each other. So uh, it was like, damn, you know, we, the opening bands that were playing before us, they would play 30 to 35 minutes, sometimes 45 minutes. And then you have us, we're just short and sweet to the point, 20 minutes and you get your money's worth. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I think uh, as we write more music, there's going to be a lot more stuff in between songs that we're going to incorporate. And like, and it's one thing too, is like, if you incorporate those things in between those songs, well, there are times where it's just those in-between moments are certain things where, um, in fans' minds, 
where it's like when you're thinking about a show, you're trying to remember something that happened, like what's the coolest thing that happened at that show. Sometimes those things that you do in between songs, that's just going to stick out in some person's mind where all of a sudden they might have not known your band going into that show. They might have not known exactly who you are, but they <laughs> saw that they remember that. Then they go home, they go to sleep covered in sweat and blood because they're probably going crazy in the mosh for the whole entire time too. They wake up the next day and all of a sudden the first thing you're going to do is they're going to try and find out, okay, what was the name of that band again? Because I remember what they did when between those songs, but I just, and I like the music, but I can't remember the name. And all of a sudden they're searching up. It's like, okay, it's definitely the Sang, Sangwasugabog. I almost messed that up. There we go. But it's like, okay, now we got to actually type this out. We're going to put this in a spot. We're going to see what happens. All of a sudden, then they're going to start listening to your stuff. They're going to just have this positive memory just by behind your listening to your music because of what they did the previous night by, Honestly, I'm just having a kick-ass time, but also just remembering that one specific thing where all of a sudden, you know, maybe you just crack a joke out, like dirt in between a song and all of a sudden it's just a joke that they absolutely found hysterical. Mm-hmm. But that just slight remembrance thing, again, you're kind of, you're basically owning, like, you're, you're owning land in their brain at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in there, in their brain rent free. Um, it's cool, you know, we've already had that happen. Like, people will remember something that I say or chant or something that we do on stage. Um, and the reason why we use it is because, you know, being, being a young guy going to these shows, like seeing obituary, you know, I could remember their front man, John Tardy, he would carry the mic stand and he would stick it out. He'd play on it. Like he's playing guitar cause he doesn't play an instrument. And that kind of like persona that he has on stage is something that I remember the most out of that band. So, uh, yeah, definitely want to have something kind of iconic that people won't shut up about you know uh we've actually printed you know shirts that have like quotes and stuff that we've said lot like live on stage and stuff too which is funny i mean that's something that also if you guys have that those shirts and all of a sudden say you say something live that is like the exact same quote and it's at a completely different show but you have those shirts printed next thing you know people are going to go to the merch table after the show or after your set and they're going to remember that line all of a sudden they're going to see that line already on one of your t-shirts. They're going to be like, holy shit, I got to go buy that now. Yep. It's a phrase that we coined. Something with Sugar Blog Incorporated. Nice. <laughs> but like what you're talking about too with just kind of owning space rent free in people's brains as well. And it's just when it comes to shows, just people remembering you. When you create a show like that, I mean, like I said, you can take someone who's never seen you before and make them a fan like instantly overnight. That's what happened when I saw Ice Nine Kills the first time. I had no clue exactly what even the band sounded like. All of a sudden, after two hours of hearing them play, being a monster, I was like, I must follow this band. This is fucking awesome. But it's, it is all based on the live show as well and the, the whole experience. So every time I listen, I'm like, I just remember that experience. It was, it was absolutely incredible. So kind of keeping that in mind where all of a sudden you're creating an experience for fans and it's just mm-hmm. like adding a little bit extra on, on your stage performance as well while also keeping exactly what you guys want to do. Play heavy, play hard, play fast, make it as energetic as possible so people are, you know, smashing each other, going crazy. People are diving off the stage. People are crowd surfing, having a great time, and just really enjoying that whole entire family vibe that rock and metal really puts forward at at live shows. I mean, you're again, people are going to remember that. People are going to go home, and then people are going to look up the band right after they wake up, like, okay, and I got to check out more music. They're going to check out more music videos. All of a sudden, next thing you know, they're going to be telling all their friends. And that's how things slowly build up. Yeah, absolutely. Word of mouth uh, is the best promotion, I, I think, you know, because um, people could uh, see an ad or something online and it's easy passable. But if you have a friend that's like, yo, you got to check this out, then you uh, you definitely consider it a lot more because otherwise I wouldn't have checked out some of the bands that I fell in love with and fell in love with like their live performance, you know, because when we play, you know, we demand people to go nuts, have a party, um, you know, and that's just like a lot of the bands that we grew up watching, like Dillinger, Skate Plan or uh, Municipal Waste, bands like that, where people are just going absolute berserk for 35 minutes. Um, and they just like threw all of their like common sense out the window and they're just like, I'm going to jump on everybody's head right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's the that's the kind of atmosphere that we want to bring always you know we don't want to play a show that's just completely tame i think that's why we've uh steered clear from doing um you know like live streams and stuff right now because you know it doesn't make sense for us to play a show and there's nobody out there in front of us to go nuts 
And that's something I can completely understand as well, because when it comes to those live stream shows that I've, I've seen people do, it's you definitely have to create an experience for the fans. Because I've seen people go out and just play like I, to be to be fair, though, the first one that I saw right when COVID hit was uh, Dropkick Murphy's did one where they just played a whole entire two hour set on St. Patrick's Day 2020. That was when everything it, was starting. It was like, sweet. I again, saw that one, too. Uh, I gotta say yeah. th- that was that was awesome due to the fact that again no one knew what was going on no mm-hmm. one knew it when like okay live music is shut down when's this gonna return we don't know and the dropping do something like that totally understandable but then going forward seeing what certain bands are doing with different live streams as I've seen this like the Save Our Stages festival bands are just going out there performing and doing different thing and just performing so it's like okay I understand that but it's something that's not really gonna draw a lot of people in. I've seen uh, I'm trying to think, Motionless and White try to do an interactive thing that actually kind of worked. Ice Nine Kills, they just uh, they basically did a whole entire stream of like a half a horror movie they kind of created and then also incorporated it in with a live show that they did. I know Falling in Reverse is working on something right now. Drunk in Reverse is doing another one for St. Patrick's Day. But I understand where you guys are coming from too because with the style of show that you guys want to have, with the style of music that you want to play, you want to have people there and you want to have people experiencing it right in front and experience it as a, as a group. Yes. We're all, if we're watching a one of your live streams, if you guys would do one, yeah, we're all going to be watching and experiencing it as a group, but we're not all in the same place. We can't feel that energy between each other. Yeah. We can't go bouncing around like a bunch of pinballs and just having a great time doing it. We just, it's, it makes a lot of sense why you guys wouldn't just do a straight live stream. Right. Yeah. We definitely need, we, we've definitely been thinking about, if we are going to do one, how can we make it different that sets us apart? How can we uh, still bring that kind of atmosphere out to people that are just watching it on their computer or watching it on their phone? So, I mean, if we do ever come out and promote a live stream, then you can expect it not just being like your run-of-the-mill typical show with the camera right in front of the stage. Um, it's definitely going to be something a little bit weird, and we're going to incorporate a lot of, a lot of cool stuff in it and, and that and that mindset makes it again a total amount of sense as well just because you want to make sure that you're going to create an experience for the fans you're not going to just ha- be like oh hey we're playing cool right and because i'll put it this way even if i if i saw that too as all of a sudden you guys were just like oh hey we're doing a live stream we're just gonna we're just gonna play like all our we're gonna play a bunch of songs for you nothing else besides that it kind of be like Re- really there's a lot of other bands that are doing that. All of a sudden, you're seeing some like, okay, we're do we're gonna be playing some songs for you, but all of a sudden, there's some other crazy shit that's gonna happen. You have no idea what is. You got to like fuck a bunch of different like those like special effects artists or special effects companies that are really working with you on something like that. Now you got something where all of a sudden people are gonna be like, okay, they've got a latch and they're playing their songs, but what else is gonna go on here? Like, is there gonna be some weird kind of like B story that comes along with it? All of a sudden, it's like, okay, you guys are playing, and all of a sudden, you know camera gets taken away by a giant by the giant dick monster and you guys got to go find him or something you guys got to battle the giant dick monster i mean it could be anything like that yeah 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 it's definitely uh we definitely uh plan on doing more content with uh the guys that have been doing our music videos and everything too so i would say um having them on board with creating some kind of live experience uh the one thing that we do want to do is if we do it even though like pre-recorded stuff like is broadcasted a lot better. You can hear everything a lot better. It's more organic. I think uh, doing it like off the top of the head, like, you know, when you're watching it, we're doing this at the same time. It's the closest thing to being a live show. We also want to do that outlet as well. So it's, it's right now we're just in the process of like trying to find a good uh, medium between doing something really exciting but also doing something right there right now and you have to be there to watch it i do absolutely like that mindset as well with that you know especially like uh, again using ice nine kills as the example when they did the whole entire like horror trope movie behind the live stream as well it's a lot of that stuff was pre-recorded so it, of course it looked really cool it, it looked like it was really well done professionally but you again, you kind of knew that it was recorded. If you guys are gonna do something like this crazy can't like crazy, you know, horror movie style, like and include your music in there and just do a bunch of different stuff with that as well. But you're also doing it live, you're not pre-recording it, you're just going about it, and all of a sudden, if something ends up going wacky and wrong and just rolling with it and improvising off of it, that's that could potentially be something where people watching it all of a sudden you know you buy like i'm just gonna use the giant dick monster example say you're fighting the big giant dick monster and all of a sudden the big giant dick monster like one of his arms falls off out of nowhere 
It's like, well, that's kind of weird, but how do you improvise on that? Next thing you know, if you're supposed to be beating him up, you just take his arm and just start whacking him in the head with his own arm. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I think it'd be exciting if, uh, you know, doing it right then and there. It's something that we definitely would have to choreograph like we're a low-budget Iron Maiden or something. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but, yeah, it's just, uh, you know, just spitballing ideas and stuff right now, uh, thinking um, – what we could do and then put pen to paper and hopefully i mean if we are going to do it we do it and it's out at a time before shows and stuff happen because i have a feeling like once everything's all over shows are back up and running uh, we're gonna you know get down to business and be really busy and stuff with playing and touring and everything I, w- I would absolutely assume so as well because once once shows are able to be uh, start playing again by this time I mean people like bands will have been without really playing live shows for over a year at this point due to the fact of different restrictions of course all over the place as well but not every band is in Florida where in Florida you can have shows at a certain percent same thing with Texas but it's because even here like in Wisconsin right now it's like I've I, I, I knew of some live shows that were happening back in 2020. I went to two of them. One had about 100, 150 people in there. One had about 50. So I'm like, yeah. I, I wanted to, it was bands that I've talked to on the podcast. I wanted to go see them live. I wanted to show my support while I could. But mm. it's just, I, it's when it comes to the types of shows that I absolutely love going to see, I mean, I'm going to see shows that are like capacity, like, you know, in between 500 to 3,000 just at the venues that I go to over here. So yeah. it's, it's, it's somewhere it's like that kind of show has not been able to happen. But once those shows come back with how many bands have not been able without all the bands that have been able to tour, I mean, it's just going to be an influx of all these bands touring as well. And because you guys want to get out there, you guys want to play live, you guys want to promote all your new stuff and get back out on the road. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be really busy for everybody. Once everything's back up and running, I just hope, uh, a lot of people aren't going to be like anti-show or not thinking it's uh, at the right right time yet. And if they do think that, by all means, they can stay home or, you know, watch watch the watch the show on a screen. Um, but yeah, as far as like those big like headlining bands, the stadium tours, the open air things, I don't see that happening for a while, um, which sucks because I love going to shows like that too. Um, yeah, you know, I have a buddy that does uh, rigging and stuff too he's he's worked a couple metallica tours um he got lucky and actually did the rig, rigging and lighting for uh the weekend for a super bowl show the super bowl halftime show that he did and um it's just gonna be weird man when everything comes back i see shows now uh I, the shows that i have been to are like patio shows so you have to stay seated you have to wear a mask um it's nothing it, there's no metal or heavy you bands playing out right now just because of the safety precautions of people having to push each other starting fights and stuff like that we we got to steer clear from that at, at as good as possible so uh yeah i've been to like maybe two or three shows since all of this happened but they've all been like lounge music trip hop or jazz and and stuff like that that's it yeah it's all been stuff where you can kind of just sit down relax have have a beer or have, have, a, have a nice uh, have a nice Cabernet and just enjoy the music and just really relax to it. Where, of course, guys like us, we want shows where, you know, we're just going to go and smash it into people. We're going to get knocked down the floor. Everyone's sweating all over each other. Everyone's picking each other back up if we get knocked down. And all of a sudden, at the end of the set, end of the show, everyone, we're all sweaty. We're all panting. We're all tired as all hell. We're all beat up. And we're high-fiving everybody. We're giving everybody hugs, fist bumps, whatever it might be. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, <laughs> that we go for. However, I, I like we were talking about like those big same trees in the open air stuff. And it is disappointing due to the fact that I'm seeing certain things with those open air uh, like festivals where all of a sudden it's like they're either being moved back to like, no, like the ones that are like May and June, they're being moved back all the way to like November. I've seen a couple get canceled outright and are never going to come back. Mm-hmm. I've seen others where it's just like here in Milwaukee with Summerfest, which is our big one, even though it's not really rock and metal anymore. Normally it's in end of June, early July. They've already moved that back to three separate weekends in September. I'm still hoping rock fest happens and that's in July. But again, as time goes on, it's just things keep getting pushed back further and further. My hope just keeps dwindling and dwindling and dwindling because I just want to get back to some live shows, man. I mean, it's, it's, it, it feels like it's like a second home, honestly. Yeah. Same here, man. Uh, you know, when I, I, I've been out of state, uh, twice, 
uh, since this whole thing has happened to and it, and it scratches a, scratches a little bit of an itch because I'm traveling, but uh, nothing uh, nothing's more satisfying than going out and playing shows. We, um, one of my bands was supposed to play a festival that got moved uh, to a year. They, they got, it got rescheduled a whole other year, and then we just found out a couple of weeks ago they're moving it to two, 2022 now, which is insane. But uh, yeah, I mean, I feel I feel bad for the people that you know that uh, attend these festivals and stuff regularly. They've already bought the tickets, and um, some of these people aren't refunding that any of them. They're just like uh, honoring their tickets for like the following year, the rescheduled date. And it's just like a whole big financial like situation that everyone's getting involved in. So um, it sucks, man. It sucks like not having any kind of certainty of, you know, when everything's going to come back. We can see flyers like every day, but there's no guarantee that any of that stuff's going to happen. And that's uh, it, it's a it's a really huge buzzkill <laughs> for sure. It, oh, it absolutely is. It's kind of like every time you see a date for a potential live show, it's like there's an asterisk right next to it because it's like, you know, that's it's it, it's a maybe it's not a certain thing anymore. And mm-hmm. for a lot of for a lot of us that listen to music, that go to concerts, that go to these festivals or like you that play this music, when it comes down to it, it's we go to these shows and you guys probably shows because it's something that we absolutely love to do. It's something where when we when we're at those shows, all our troubles seem to just go away for that for however many hours we're there. All the crap that's gone in life, you know, things could be going absolutely horrible. I've been to that point where all of a sudden it's like things have been going, it just got awful, horrible, and I didn't want to do anything. I just kind of wanted to hope everything would end. And next yeah. thing you know, I go to a show and for the next hour and a half, it's like, it's like nothing ever, it's like nothing happened. It's like yeah. all those problems just completely went away. And I was just the happiest person in the world at that point. For sure. Yeah, that's definitely always a uh, rewarding feeling is like, you know, I feel bad for like a lot of the smaller shows and stuff too, because there's been a lot of venues and bars and stuff closing because they can't keep the lights on because there's no shows, there's no regular attendance and stuff happening. And it's always a rewarding feeling like you have a bad day at work or something's going on in your personal life and you already had planned on going to this show, but you're just like, man, never mind. And your friend's like, dude, come on. And then you make it out there and you're having the time of your life and then you forget why you were even pissed off in the first place and you know that being a fan is a rewarding feeling and you know i'm we sit here and twiddle our thumbs uh as a band and we're just like man i would gladly drive six hours to play some dive bar on a monday and load a bunch of gear and unload a bunch of gear right back off as much as it sucks and how much of a drag it is I would I would do 30 days of that, 40 days of that, and not make a red cent just so I could play shows and say I'm playing shows again. Yeah, exa- exactly. It's something that just makes you incredibly happy. It's honestly therapeutic in a way just because, mm. again, you could be having the worst couple of days, you could have the worst time, and all of a sudden you go to a show, you play a show, and it's just all that shit goes away. And when you're talking about, you know, you don't want to go – you have tickets for a show, you don't want to go, and your friend's like, oh, my God, you got to come to the, this show – I have that happen to me all the time too. It's like, I'm tired. I don't want to go to a show. However, I don't have a friend that can ever drag me to those shows because I'm the only one that has a ticket for it. So I end up dragging myself to it. I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to go. Alrighty, let's go <laughs> drag myself to it. And then all of a sudden, you know, first 10 minutes of the show, I get in the match, I get knocked down once. And all of a sudden the adrenaline just spikes and I'm like, I'm ready to go the rest of the night. Let's do this shit. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I'm a, uh, I'm always the type of, person too is um there's a show happening but it's like three and a half hours away and i have a friend that wants to go and i plan on driving by myself so i'm just like dude i'll come scoop you you know so i always end up with at least like one or two other people that really had no huge intentions on going to the show but they're riding with me and we're going and uh i miss it a lot yeah, I mean, I like there's other times too where it's like because being in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, it's like yeah, we get a lot of shows to come our way as well. But there's a lot of times where there's bands on different tours that I want to go see, but all of a sudden, you know, they're gonna they're gonna make a stop in Chicago instead because Chicago's a lot bigger, or they're gonna go to Madison, Wisconsin, or they're gonna go all the way to Minneapolis, and I'm just like, well, do I want to go to the show or do I not want to go to the show? Yeah, and it's like okay, if it's in if it's in Madison, I'll just drive there. It's a little more than an hour for me. I'll drive back the same day, no big deal. Chicago hour and a half. 
hell yeah, why the hell wouldn't mm-hmm. I do that? Go to Minneapolis, and I'm like, um, I gotta call my friends and see who I can stay with that night because I'm not driving back like five hours at eleven at night, like, and then getting home at four in the morning. That's just not happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've been uh been there plenty of times. I've had to you know drive to like Lafayette, Indiana, which is like three and a half hours from us, or uh, Chicago, which is six hours, and um. You know, we try to make like a two or three day thing of it and try to see sites, but also see these bands and everything, too. And, uh, yeah, even though we're tired, our butts hurt from sitting in a <laughs> car all the time. We're just like, here it goes. And then you see a band that you're anxious to see and they absolutely kill it or they don't. And you have a good time regardless. It's sick. Yeah. And then and then you look back at those times in a time like this where, you know, live shows aren't happy. And you remember all those good times. You had all the good friends that you made at those shows. Hell, I speak about this all the time. I remember like here in Milwaukee at our the biggest thing we have called the Rave. I, every show I'd go to in 2019, I would see like the same 10, 11 people all the time at these shows. I basically kind of coined them as my concert family. I have no clue what the hell their names are. I know what their faces <laughs> look like though. And I'd see them at every single show. We all know who each other was, but we have no idea what our names are. And I miss them dearly because it's just like, I love seeing them at shows. And all of a sudden... You know, next thing I know, I'm in a mosque. I get completely blindside hit by one of these guys. And I look who it is. And the guy just smiling. Like, it's a guy I see here all the time. So I'm just sitting there, like, laying in the ground, potentially bleed. Like, all right, man. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we, uh, you know, we have uh, family um, all over the country. Uh, now, funny enough, like, some of the, uh, I'd say most of the extras that were in that Minstrel Envy music video um, are actually uh, good friends of ours. Um, cause we played, it was filmed in New York, which we've played a lot, uh, especially about Brooklyn. And, um, a lot of those people that were in those video in that video were people that attended, uh, the many times that we played like St. Vitus or the bug jar. Um, you know, people came from, uh, Connecticut. They came from, uh, Rhode Island and stuff too. And they all like met up with us. We hung out and we're like, all right, let's shoot a, a miniature horror movie, I guess. So. <laughs> But that's cool as well, just due to the fact that, you know, you have these positive connections with your fans as well, and that you're continually just, you know, making connections with them, not only just through the music, not like you're performing and then have them have those positive experiences, but then you're connecting with them on a personal level and you're including them in the music video as well. I've seen other bands pull the same move as well, and I, I got to say, it works every single time. Absolutely. Um, you know, a band that starts from nothing and gets successful uh, without their fan base, they're nothing without them. So, um, you got to remember where you came from and you got to remember who's always loved you and, uh, always got to keep them close with you. So, um, I can name just about everybody that was in that video, you know, like Zach mild, Jackie bet, um, Phil Charles, so many people that were in that video that I'll never forget, you know, even 10 years from now because of the memories that we have with them. And they're never going to forget you for the rest of their lives due to the fact that they've connected so well with your band and all of a sudden, you know, you're you're really connected with them on a personal level. You're They're in your music video and something that they're going to, you know, continually tell their friends. It's just like, hey, check out this music video. And there are people are wondering, why the heck should I check this out? It's like, well, wait till you see. You'll see why. And they'll yeah. listen to the music and it's like even if they're not into death metal, they're going to be like, okay, I've got to listen to this thing the whole way through to see why my friend wants me to see this. And all of a sudden, you know, close to the end of the video, all of a sudden they show up. And mm-hmm. then that person that might that might not necessarily even be in death metal at all, they're going to have this positive relationship with your band just off that because their friends were in your music video. And it's like, holy shit, this is awesome. Then they're going to talk to their friends about it. Then they're going to get more connected with, with you, the band, just by listening to you. The next time shows come back and they're able to, you know, these all of a sudden like, oh my God, you guys are going to that show for that band that you were in a music video in? Can I come along too? And then all of a sudden you've got people that are just, again, it's just, it's a slow growth kind of thing with those close people, but because they're so dedicated to it, it's just going to, you're going to create more dedicated fans and a more dedicated fan base off of doing something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. uh, There's definitely a a method uh, to all the madness that, you know, we, uh, we create, Um, you know, we stayed, uh, stayed a couple nights with two of the people that were in that music video. And um, they had a roommate. His name's Peter. He's also in the music video as well. And he 
and he would tell us every single time like he's like man i don't even listen to that style of music but he's like you guys are hard i i own every one of your guys' shirts and he's like i just like you guys as as people so much that it made me fall in love with your band and that's something that uh you know we hold uh a little bit more dear to our hearts than people that are just like dude your band rules i love your band you know this guy's like literally coming out saying hey i love you as a person i love you guys all as people and that's even sicker so because it's it's more of a personal connection at that point too it's your it's you're not just having a positive impact on these people's lives through your music like you're having a positive impact on this guy's life life not only through the music but also just through you who you are as a person as well and then you mean you never know what people might be going through up to that point but just all of a sudden meeting someone and be having it be like getting more personal with a band that they absolutely love is mm-hmm. if they're going through the worst possible time in the history of the world just something like that can just take the worst possible day the, the worst possible time and just make it seem not so bad oh yeah yeah and uh you know that's something that we uh you know we hear we get a lot of messages uh from our fans too and um you know that say like man your your music got me through a rough time in my life or uh you know uh i I was really bummed out until i found out about you guys or you guys inspire me to do this in music and things like that and uh i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't doubt for a single bit i mean we we respond to every single message that we receive in, in in that regard and uh you know like that that peter dude i was telling you about um you know he said we're not even his like cup of tea like as far as style of music but he likes us you know i he's reached out to me and said like hey would you jump on a song for my band or would you want to do a studio project with me i was like dude absolutely so uh we uh we definitely appreciate every fan that we get every fan that we have um to a whole other degree like we you know we look at them as like literally our personal like best friends and when it, well, looking at people like that as well that's something that especially as the band grows as sangwa sugabag want to make sure i said that right once again as you guys grow mm-hmm. if you continue to try and do your best to make sure that you respond to every message you have no idea how far that actually goes because again it's when people send you messages when people send all these different bands messages a lot of times it's they go they go ignored now sometimes it gets again when you get super duper big there's so many coming through if you try to respond to every single one every single day i mean that could be a basically a whole day job right there and i know that that could be a little bit too much however by taking the time to to respond to a good amount of these though and with your levels of responding to every single one that you possibly can it's going to be something where people again it's going to create that personal connection you're really going to be able to create fans for life just based off of that it's it's the, I'm trying to think, it's the emotional equity that is created there. There's me using some economics terms right there. I knew I was going to use my degree for something. I didn't know it was just bringing up random terms. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I think uh, when we make uh, the band a little bit more personable and we let our uh, personalities and everything shine through, if you're a fan of us, then, then you definitely like us as people too. Uh, so, um, I know once things get bigger and everything for us, it'll be hard to have that relationship with everybody. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, something people like to say is like stick with your uh, A1 since day one. So the people that were there from the beginning watched us play our very first show in a garage that are still watching us, still going out and seeing us. Uh, those are definitely people that will uh, keep near and dear to our hearts and we'll always shout them out any chance we get it. Oh, absolutely. Because then it, again, even for people that are just getting into the band, it creates a feeling that when you stick with the band, the band recognizes it. I, I mean, and that could be for any band as well. It's like when you stick with them for so long, it's going to be somewhere you're going to be at a show and all of a sudden you're going to feel that you're in a little bit kind of a part of the whole entire experience as well. It's kind of like you're not you're not part of the band, but you're part of the family that is around the band, the part that is helping the band grow, helping the band just really reach the heights they want to and helping get more people to know about the band while also really experiencing everything for yourself as well. It's just a whole mixture of things where the people that have been there from day one are experiencing it and they're growing with you. People are going to come in a lot later in the game that ex- that really want to just be a part of that. All they got to do is just, you know, continue to support the band. That's pretty much it. And they're going to end up feeling that same sort of pride that a lot of other people do. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I have that relationship with, uh, my favorite band, uh, from out of Ohio too. And it's, it's, it's really funny, you know, seeing them, um, they're called mutal hatred and, uh, two of the members in the bands are, uh, tattoo artists and my arms are, are covered by, you know, members in the band. I've developed a relationship with them. They're like my best friends. I'll go to their hometown and we'll just hang and stuff. And, uh, we love them so much. You know, we've taken them out on our first tour and, and we've told them to, you know, as where we go, you'll go. So, you know, you guys are our best friends. So if we're, if we're doing a lengthy tour and there's some money to be made or something, and you guys want to play out to a crowd you never played with before, uh, you're along for the ride. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome. You know, every time we're on tour, making, uh, making friends with other bands that we're on tour with and making friends with, uh, a lot of fans. And I'd say that, you know, every fan that comes out and wants to talk and hang out with us or party with us or whatever, uh, you know, those are people that will also like hit up, like, why aren't you here? Or like, Oh, you're here. It's good seeing you. What are you doing after the show? Let's hang out tonight. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely like a, a brotherhood, so to speak. Oh, it is. And I, I kind of understand that as well, just through the fact that, cause I've been doing this podcast for, I th- would have to say about two years at this point. I've interviewed a good like a, a good amount of bands, and of course, with once COVID happened too, I wasn't able to see as many as I would have liked. I think I've seen four up to this point play live at some point, and it's just when I go there, it's just you know they're not playing the you're not playing the they're not playing the biggest venues. They're not playing you know these two like two thousand three thousand seat venues. It's sometimes I've seen bands that like, you know, play for a hundred. I've seen band play for 200. I've seen, a ba- I've seen two bands play for 50 and that was it. But it's just, I wanted to show up and see them because I've loved talking on the podcast. I want to go and make sure I support them as well because they've got great music and all the bands that are really working to come up and become those big bands. They're the future of rock and metal right now and all the subgenres. So I want to make sure I support this because I like the music just as much and going to those shows that's also i have a and i have a blast going to them too because all of a sudden it's i'm meeting people that love the band at that like you know they've been around since day 1 at that kind of level and you know those fans as well and all of a sudden it's just it's, it has that family vibe to it and i totally understand that and it's just something where i again i wish live shows were going on right now cuz all of a sudden all these different bands potentially coming through you know Milwaukee even if they're in Chicago or Madison all of a sudden i'm seeing them pop up all of a sudden, you know, people, these bands are going to be on stage. They're going to be going crazy in the mosh. They're going to be starting a crazy mosh pit. And they're going to see some guy with his head completely split open. It's like, okay, we got to make sure that guy gets his medical attention. All of a sudden, wait, wait, Kevin, is that you? And you're just going to see me going like, yep, it's me. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, that that's something I can't wait for as well. It's like, uh, I want to so bad just to say hell with it and, you know, throw a show like in my in my basement or something but you know like totally can't do it but uh but yeah you know um when everything gets back uh to normal or whatever we're gonna call normal at that time i definitely want to take like a lot of our friends bands and stuff out with us too and you know live out our party and our dreams and stuff that we all have no absolutely i mean if if this whole entire covid situation has taught us anything it's that Yes, anything can happen, and the crazy, thing, the crazy things in the world can happen. However, when it comes down to it, it's like when it, with this life, nothing is guaranteed. So if you're gonna try and follow your dreams, you only get one shot at this. So go for it, make it happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely uh, go all out, hit the ground running, just like David Lee Roth already always said. Exactly. You know, so. Exactly. Uh, However, <laughs> when live shows return, Devin, I will say this though. If, if there's a chance you come around, you know, Meyer, you know, if you're in Chicago, Milwaukee, Madison, whatever it is, let me know for a couple of reasons. One, I want to see you guys play live. I want to be in that crazy mosh. I want to be in the wall death. If my head gets split open, it happens. If I break my nose, like I almost did one time, it happens. If all of a sudden, you know, I get, you know, have like a, my arm, you know, it's like hanging off and my wrist is completely a different way and I'm still going crazy. It might happen. No biggie. <laughs> However, I do want to see you guys play live and Whenever I talk to a band, the podcast I absolutely love, which is pretty much every single band at this point, because I always love these conversations. One, it's pretty much the highlight of my day every time I get to do this. Oh, yeah. I like to. I have this thing that I always promise bands because it's not is a if it's a when, but this is also a promise too. And I think you're gonna like this one because the promise is when I see you play live for the first time, first round's on me. Awesome, man. Yeah, we uh, we're pretty we're cheap dates, 
So, uh, <laughs> you know, a nice, uh, nice PBR or something would be cool. And then if, uh, if you break your arm or something, we'll take one of our shirts or long sleeves and just create a sling or something. <laughs> And I'll still buy the first round. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. all right. It's also like sling. All right. It's like, all right, five PBRs, man. Wait, but your arm is broken. I know what I said. Five PBRs. <laughs> Here's my card. And also it's like, are, are you sure you need to go to the hospital? I probably do. After I have a PBR with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Can't wait, man. I, I can't wait either. And as we close up, I want to make sure that you have enough time to make sure you make it to your next interview following this one. Um, I always like to give you a chance to say whatever you want, plug whatever you want at the end of the podcast. So at the moment, Devin, the floor is yours. Yep. Uh, just everybody, you know, if you can uh, get your hands on uh, our debut full length tortured hole, uh, which is out March 26th through Century Media Records. And, um, you know, Keep tabs on all of us. Um, everyone in the band's in a bunch of different projects, so we'll have a bunch more stuff to release. Um, we have a couple music videos and stuff to release as well. Um, hopefully, a live stream, you know, before shows and stuff come back in order. Uh, so hopefully, you can catch us on that. And uh, other than that, man, just stay heavy. And uh, you know, thanks for all the support. All right, now it's time for my turn to close out with a couple of things. First thing is, when it comes to making sure that you keep up with Sanguisugabag, when it comes to the debut album Torture Hole, when it comes to finding them on social media, when it comes to just keeping tabs on everything they do, social media-wise, internet-wise, whatever it is, when it comes to looking for all those different social media platforms, whatever it is, again, take a look at the description of the podcast because wherever I can find them, wherever I can find their socials music, I'm going to have every single link down there for you so that I'm going to make it as easy as possible for you guys to find the band, whether you're watching on YouTube, whether you're listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio. Again, description, the links are going to be there for Sanguisugabog. And make sure you watch the video for Menstrual Envy because it is freaking hilarious. But also, make sure the kids aren't around because it is definitely not safe for work. <laughs> and when Tortured Hole comes out, again, it's out on March 26th. Make sure that you guys pre-save that bad boy so that when it comes out, you can listen to it and... On that end, Devin, I cannot say goodbye on this podcast in all good conscience due to the fact that I want to see you guys alive. I made the promise of first rounds on me, even if my arm's in a sling, still paying for that round first rounds on me. So I cannot say goodbye to close with this podcast. I have to end it with. See you later. Take it easy, man. See you later. Well, uh, folks, I'm interview with Devin from the band Sangua Sugabog. Yes, that is Sangua Sugabog. And remember, Tortured Hole, their debut album, comes out on March 26th. Any link that you need to find the band, whether it's stream online or whether it's find them on social media, wherever it might be, again, look at the description of the podcast. Everything is all there. And I cannot wait to actually see this band play live. I cannot wait to see Sangua Sugabog play a show and be there. Go crazy in the mosh pit, potentially break my arm. And if I do break my arm, again, please, Devin. And the guys from Sangwa Sugabog, just give me a t-shirt, put my arm in a sling. First round still on me, guys. So then on that note, that's going to be for me today, guys. Thank you for watching listening to the Code Progression Podcast with MSD Rocks for Rock Metal Thrive. My name is Kevin, and you guys know how I am every single one of them with a big, healthy, and hearty. See y'all.